Well, welcome, everybody, to this episode of Beyond the Crucible. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show and the communications director for Crucible Leadership. Uh, you have clicked play on. We hope you've clicked subscribe to a podcast that deals in what we call crucible experiences. Now, you may not know exactly what that phrase means yet, but you know what a crucible experience is because chances are you've been through one. Crucible experiences are those things in life that are painful, that are traumas, tragedies, setbacks, failures, um, things that knock the wind out of your sails. And that's going to become an important metaphor as we talk in this episode today. Things that knock the wind out of your sails, that knock you uh, feel like they, and, and do in fact, knock you off the trajectory of your life sometimes. But here's the good news. We don't talk about them here just to kind of swap war stories. We talk about them here because uh, we want to offer hope and we want to offer healing for those of you uh, who have been through crucible experiences. And we do that by bringing on guests who have been through crucibles, some of which you uh, maybe have been through, some of which you can't imagine. Our guest today is one that you probably can't imagine, uh, her crucible, and um, just how you get through it, learn the lessons and move forward toward um, a better tomorrow. And uh, the guest who is here today, I will introduce in a moment. But first, I have to bring in the host of the show, the, and I, I've said this before, and it's so appropriate now, the captain of Beyond the Crucible and Crucible Leadership, Crucible Leadership founder, Warwick Fairfax. Hey, Gary, it's great to be here. Very much looking forward to this episode. Yeah, this will be good. And the reason I said earlier that um, uh, some, some nautical metaphors would be in place is that our guest today is Lisa Blair. And Lisa made history by becoming the first woman to sail solo around Antarctica with one stop. Lisa also led the first all-female team to compete in the 2017 Rolex Sydney to Hobart yacht race in 16 years. And in December of 2018, because she hadn't already done enough world record setting stuff, <laughs> set two more world records, becoming the first woman to sail solo, nonstop, and unassisted around Australia, and establishing a new monohull speed record for the solo, nonstop, and unassisted category with an established time of 58 days. Lisa has sailed more than 80,000 nautical miles and holds a RYA Yacht Mast Offshore Master 5 and Med 3. Personally, I don't know what those are. Hopefully, she'll explain those to us, but I'm, I, I can guarantee you they are impressive. Lisa has recently published her debut book, Facing Fear, published by Australian Geographic, and actively presents as a keynote speaker around Australia. You can follow her ongoing adventures on her website, and we'll give it to you again later, but her website is lisablairsalestheworld.com, and she does indeed. Warwick, take it away. Well, Lisa, it is so exciting to have you. Um, when I got the book, I mean, it was like reading a thriller. I read it in pretty much one sitting. It's like, I mean, I knew because you were coming on the podcast that you made it. So that was obviously good. And I think as you've mentioned, there wouldn't be a book if uh, you hadn't made it. So thankfully, it was, I mean, it, it's hard to believe that it actually happened, but it's uh, obviously it did. It was so, so compelling, so exciting. And, uh, you know, you have a lot of sailing terminology, and I'm one of those people that knows pretty much nothing about sailing. So I'm like, okay, let's <laughs> get, you know, jibing and tagging, some vague idea, prevent lines. Not totally clear about that, but obviously I'm sure we'll get into it. But, um, yeah, sadly, uh, I get uh, seasick just looking at water. I'm just one of these <laughs> land lovers. But uh, just a little Australian history here. Obviously, as most Australians know, my family were involved in newspaper business, Sydney Morning Herald, and all for generations. Well, I had a great grandfather that was Commodore of the Royal Sydney Yacht Squadron. Supposedly, he had some great big steam yacht. I don't know if that's even possible. Probably 1890s, 1900s, some big thing with the crew. So anyway, but kind of the genes um, didn't carry on to me. So, <laughs> uh, but, uh, 
in fact, I get so seasick if I get seasick that it takes me days to recover. So it's, <laughs> it's uh, probably not an adventure I'll be seeking. But all that being said, uh, obviously, love to hear about your whole Antarctic uh, uh, journey. But I'd like to hear some of the backstory. You talk a bit about in uh, your book about growing up with your parents and, you know, school being tough, being bullied a bit. And just talk about what life was like for you growing up and sort of the, uh, the pre-sailing Lisa Blair, if you will. Well, firstly, I just want to say thanks so much for having me on the show. It's going to be a great chat today. Um, I'm so happy that you love the book and um, hopefully other people can get out and have a read of it too at some point. Uh, as far as my childhood goes, yeah, I mean, I was landlocked. Uh, so I grew up on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Australia. So we, we had this property that was about 30 minutes from the beach, but it was a little bush property. It was all solar powered. And, uh, you know, we would pump the water up from the creek and we would have a, a selection of either rainwater or creek water, which we aptly dubbed, uh, given that we're Aussie, um, platypus piss or leaf <laughs> stew. So you would choose between the two different types of water. <laughs> It's so that great. was kind of, yeah, it's very Aussie, right? Um, so, <laughs> so that was kind of my um, childhood. Like we didn't have TV really. We were allowed a movie a week, which was, um, you know, a family night. And we would run the generator so that we could run the washing machine and we would have a movie at that time. And occasionally we'd be allowed like half an hour of TV in the evening. But I think the best thing about that childhood, whilst as a kid, it did um, sort of set me on the outs as far as uh, not being cool enough, not having seen the latest TV shows and, and not fitting in as much with schools. Um, it did allow me really to create a sense of imagination and a sense of dreaming and, and sort of build capabilities, I think, that have served me really well through life by having that slightly more unusual childhood. So um, I definitely thank you to my parents for having that. And um, yeah, and then that's led me on the path to, to challenges and adventures, which has eventually led me to discover sailing when I was um, 22. And I just randomly got a job in the Wit Sundays. So I saw it before we get to that, I think one of the things you mentioned is um, uh, as you were going to uni, I think it was Southern Cross University, which probably I think yes. it's, it was more northern New South Wales. Uh, a while before then, school wasn't easy and, you know, just how kids treated you, but it felt like you made a purposeful decision then that you were going yes. to approach, you were going to, I don't know about be different, approach it differently. So talk about, cause that was sort of a mini decision that, you know, obviously kind of uh, helps as, as we uh, get on in life. So talk about what was that decision you made as you were going to uni? Yeah. So it was a four hour drive um, from where we grew up to where I was going to uni. So I was driving down in the car with mum um, and just in the car, I, I just remember thinking about where I was at that moment in time, as far as who I was and, and did I, was I happy and, and was I doing what I wanted to do? And I remember sort of feeling like at high school, everyone knows who you are. So if you're the girl that was bullied, you're always going to be the girl that was bullied. Getting out of that is really hard to do. And so when I was going to uni, the last thing I wanted to do was to continue being that girl, that person that was sort of more reserved, hiding in the art studio, not quite being who I wanted to be, a bit of a loner, um, not many friends. And then the friends I did have weren't even in my age range. Um, so I made a conscious decision as we drove down in the car. And I remember thinking, well, you know, this isn't sort of a life I envisioned for myself and that's the life I was leading. But because I'm changing states and because I'm changing locations, I have this really unique opportunity to project myself or position myself in a different way because in my mind, nobody down there actually knew who I was. So they didn't have this preconceived opinion of me being the girl that was always bullied or, you know, the loner that was the outcast. So when I drove down, I, I decided that I wanted to be this bubbly, outspoken, outgoing, fun-loving person. And um, it was a pretty terrifying decision to make, but it was a conscious decision. And so when I actually arrived, the first thing I did, I walked right up to my new flatmates in the share accommodation, said, hi, I'm Lisa, and just started projecting this kind of person that I always felt I was, but hadn't really had the chance to show people yet. Um, and the four years or five years that I was at uni was 
was really a huge growth uh, for me as a person. And I was really fortunate with my friendship circle down there that they really allowed me and pushed me to, um, you know, expand out of that preconceived idea of the girl that was always isolated or lonely or, um, you know, the girl who was bullied. So it really set me up for future careers. It's funny. I think one of the things we often find on Beyond the Crucible is it's those early life stories that can be such, I don't want to say it's an origin story, as they say in movies, you know, <laughs> it, it can be like, you know, little clues to um, who Lisa Blair became later. And I know, you know, obviously we grew up very differently. I grew up in about as wealthy upbringing as it's possible in Australia. But, you know, because my family were in this big family media business deal, the other kids, the other boys went to a boys' school. They weren't kind of like me. And so it was like, oh, you know, because Australians are very much into egalitarian tall poppy syndrome, which basically means if you stick your head up, it gets cut off. Unless you, you know, If you're good at sports, it's okay. But if you're good at any other area, somehow yeah. you must be arrogant by definition. So, but, you know, a little bit like you in the sense, I, I was a bit of a loner, but I think it's, it's okay to, if that means being who you are and not just going with the crowd and doing what everybody else does, that's not yeah. wrong. It's just, you got to figure out your own path and what that means to you. So, I think there are lessons for a lot of people about how you handled that saying, okay, I'm not going to go with, I want to be not quite so isolated, but I'm not going to just be who everybody wants me to be. Yeah. I dream, I have thoughts, I have ambitions and that's okay. You know, I'm not going to just be some hanger on of some group. Just and I think also at that age, um, you know, you have some really strong principles and it's very easy to sort of get swept up in what everyone else is doing and, and not live by your principles. And I remember a lot of the bullying started when I would stand up for people teasing animals or, um, you know, picking on other people and things like that. And so it was from me being as true to myself that the bullying actually started. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's really important. And I think, you know, if you're for anyone out there that might have gone through that or is going through that, uh, you can create your own circumstances. So if people are bullying you, you can let that beat you or you can position it differently and actually allow that to make you stronger and allow that to allow you to then go out and help other people and become a better person from it. Um, you want to jump in, Gary? I was going to jump in and say just to, to, to sort of pull together what Warwick just said and what you just said, Lisa, um, and it's a key principle of crucible leadership and yeah. that is authenticity yeah. being the authentic you uh it took warwick it, it it took you to go through the failure of the takeover of the family business to step out of uh the vision that was kind of cast that you inherited that was that was passed on to you and that's where you found your stride and found yourself and it sounds lisa like you um the same thing happened you were you were not living authentically you stepped into that you made a decision one day i'm going to be who i've always felt i was inside but i never felt i really could express all that well yeah and you began to do that and it it, it changed and for listeners who hear that that's an important thing to remember authenticity is uh is a key first can often be a key first step to moving beyond uh, and getting through a crucible. Absolutely. And staying true to your values, which is exactly what Lisa did, which is so impressive at such a young age. So I want to talk a bit about, uh, speaking of origin stories, the sailing origin story. You <laughs> mentioned, I don't know if it's while I was at uni or maybe afterwards, you had experience at the Whitsunday Islands, but there was this epic trip that you did with a friend and maybe her parents that was Australia to Hawaii, which is, and it's got to be hundreds and hundreds of miles. It's not a short trip, but was that one of those early key moments in which you found this is something that I love to do that I was born to sail? Was that sort of part of one of those early steps? Yeah, most definitely. So I, um, I randomly got a job in the Whitsunday Islands just for a summer holiday job uh, as the cook and the cleaner on a charter yacht. And that really was my first key um, sort of discovery into sailing. I had been on boats as a kid and my mum's partner, John, he had had a boat, um, you know, when I was growing up, but it was never something I did. It was always something they did and it was this external thing to me. And so I'd been working on these charter yachts for about a year and I was just loving it. And I never 
visioned or envisioned that sailing would be more than just a summer holiday or a fun thing to do on the Mm. odd occasion. Like I really had absolutely no plans to do anything with sailing at this point. And I was studying visual arts and education at uni with the plan of becoming an art teacher. Like I just, it was just so left field from anything that I had envisioned. And then I finished, I had to go back and finish two weeks of uni. And so I finished the last two weeks of university, graduated. And then a week after I finished, I got this phone call out of the blue. And it was a friend of mine from uni. And she was sailing to Hawaii with her father on their boat. And they had a crew member had to leave in Samoa. And so they called me up and said, hey, do you think you can get here in a week? Uh, we're sailing to Hawaii. Are you interested? And uh, me being me, jumped on the opportunity <laughs> and uh, <laughs> said yes. I'd only ever left the country once before. And, um, yeah, so I had to figure out how to make it possible in a week and, and then jumped on a plane and flew to Samoa. And then we sailed to Hawaii. And that trip really shaped my love of ocean sailing. I remember one of the first nights at sea we were – just sailing out and I'd never done night watch. I'd never stood a a watch in the dark or anything like that. And there was just this magic moment on deck, keeping watch. Everyone else is sleeping. It was the middle of the night, crystal clear skies. And this couple of whales just popped up around the Mm. boat. And it was a dark night. You couldn't see them, but you could just hear them breathing and coasting through the waters. And it was just, for me, it was this real incredible moment of just peace. And I realized through sailing well through our normal lives we're so rush 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 everything's busy we've got a billion things going on we're always contactable on our phones we've got to have them close like it's just this constant rush and I just felt the minute I got out to sea it was this simplified almost basic lifestyle kind of camping on the water where your entire world revolves around eat sleep and sail and what's the weather pattern going to do and for me I just loved it and there's so much beauty out there so yeah I definitely it definitely shaped um, my my wanting to do more with sailing at that point it sounds like you fell in love with sailing and you know, I was made to do this. I was made to sail. Was there that kind of feeling that this is, I don't know if you said it was your happy place, but it's some, there's something about that that really, I don't know, it was like a, a, a song that sort of sung to your soul or something. I can't think of the exact metaphor, but did it feel like this is your, this is your place, this is your element? Yeah, it definitely did. But it also, like sailing's still hard. Like it's right. every <laughs> every day is a challenge because you've got yeah. to breathe and live and, and, you know, survive in this environment yeah. we're not designed for. Um, so I think I also really relish the challenge of having to get from country to country just harnessing the power of the wind. And how do you do that? And, and what's the process that makes that possible? And, you know, we had engine issues. How do you fix an engine at sea where you've got no spare parts? Like, you know, and we, I think the owner of the boat made a muffler out of a tin can at one point. And <laughs> like, it was just this huge adventure. Like, and I just, yeah, I relished in that opportunity, but I also just found a bit of my soul. And one of the things I love that you write in your book, Lisa, about that experience, and this is a perfect time to bring it in, because you're talking about these extraordinary adventures, and you write about reading the stories of other folks who had 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 adventures on the seas. And you wrote why you became fascinated with it. And I want listeners to hear why the, the adventures you read were fascinating to you. I became fascinated by these adventures, and I realized how relatable these people were. They were actually, uh, there was actually nothing special about them. They just found their dream, set themselves a goal, and worked very hard to achieve it. It just so happened that their goals were extraordinary. That can apply to anybody listening to this show right now. You, do ex- you have done extraordinary things, but from the beginning, you have not viewed yourself as necessarily extraordinary. You're just someone who has a dream and is working hard at it. Yeah, and I I honestly feel like that's applicable to all areas of your life as well. It doesn't have to be a record. It doesn't have to be this. It could be a business goal. It could be a family-orientated goal. It could be the goal of buying your first house. Like, it's that mentality is really applicable to anything that people achieve in their life or that they want to achieve in their life. And um, the one thing I do really try and highlight is that, I don't feel different 
from anybody else because of my achievements. I feel like your average Joe Blow still, and I, um, I still can't spell to save my life. I still, <laughs> you know, get me trying to add math and I'm going to fail. Like I, I don't have this special set of skills, but what I have is passion and focus and determination and sticking power. And so when things do get hard and when those crucible moments come through, I stick to it until I can push myself through it. And I guess that's my real superpower, the fact that I'm stubborn. <laughs> well, I mean, you have dreams and you're willing, you're willing to go for them. You're willing to risk failure. You know, you're willing to... Um, to try. I mean, one great example, sort of next step on the journey, perhaps, is the 2011-12 uh, round the world, um, you know, Clipper yacht race. I think one of the things you write is that you, it was, I forget how much was it, fifty, it was sixty thousand. I forget how many, uh, how much money it was some massive amount of money, and you only had half the amount to do the training part. And your mom said, "Well, you can at least do that." And then maybe you'll, you'll figure out how to raise the rest. I mean, it's this sense of I'm not quitting just because I'm halfway there. So talk about, because that's a, a microcosm of something a lot of us can learn is you weren't willing to quit just because it was hard to get into this round the world race. Yeah. And I think um, one of the biggest things I did to myself or one of the biggest benefits I gave myself was that I, I reframed failure in my mind. And failure was the, the not going for the goal. That was the failure. Because if you didn't start something, then you've already failed. Whereas if I go for the goal and I put 100% of my effort in and I've literally tried everything I can think of to make it successful and to make it work and I've explored every avenue and possibility and I still fail, then that's just a lesson. That's just a learning curve. And from there you can move on. But if you don't even try, then that's, to me, like the real failure. So, I, I mean, in that book, I do talk about breaking down in tears to my mum, telling her how much I failed and, um, you know, how that I haven't got enough money and that I should just pull out now and it's never going to work. And I had this kind of incre intense moment of doubt and self-fear. And, um, and mum's always been a really incredible moral compass for me and she's been able to sort of re point me back in the right direction or or she takes the emotion out of it so I can think logically about where I am and the situation. And my ultimate goals for signing up for that yacht race was to get experience, to, to learn how to sail properly and to, to get enough experience to one day want to try solo sailing. And so by going and doing the training, at least I'm getting that knowledge. And then it's just that whole, well, who knows? I still had a few months and I, I wasn't sure what was going to happen, but at least I continue to try and, you know, it worked out in the end. Yeah, and what you're saying, you know, is, is so profound is reframing failure, saying failure is not trying. If you try and give it 100%, that's not failing. I mean, I haven't heard a whole lot of people define or redefine failure that way. I mean, you know, it gives you the freedom to try because, you know, if you try, it's not so much failing. You've given it your all. That's just a brilliant way of, putting it so so that gave you some experience and the money came in for you to you know as so you met some folks uh probably in england you know just amazing things happen when you put yourself out there and i really believe miracles happen and you've had a, your share of miracles or people at the last moment coming across and saying here lisa it's like it's unbelievable but it's i mean you write about it, it's obviously true so yeah and know. i <laughs> yeah and it's also <laughs> one of those things that um People often say, oh, you're so lucky. And I'm like, it's not luck. You create your own luck. If you put yourself out enough times, someone's going to see that and someone's going to step up and help you and support you and, and try and like help get you to the next step. People want others to succeed. People want those around them to succeed. They don't want them to fail. And so everyone is there to help you. It's it's how much you try that actually creates that help and opens those doors and opens those opportunities. Not much is given for free in life, but you can create those opportunities by trying. And, um, and that was the real lesson that I got out of the Clipper race was that 
when people really started to see me put the effort in and, and I had sacrificed so much of my time and my energy and every cent I'd earned in the last 12 months to go into this event and people saw that and the dedication and the drive to succeed, they then turned around and helped and I was able to get that money and, and then set off and, and do this incredible adventure. Again, another profound point. You you made your own luck by putting yourself out there. People do actually want to help other people. Yeah. Somebody that has a goal and a dream is willing to work hard, whether it's uh, Dick Smith or uh, a number of others. Um, it's um, you know it's kind of a coincidence. Uh, we had another Aussie on the podcast a little bit ago, Ryan Campbell, who uh, who probably heard of who uh, flew around the world solo, youngest at twenty three and. You know, he was sort of young and, and didn't really know what you weren't supposed to do. So he also went to Dick Smith and got some funding. And <laughs> you know, amazingly, you know, for a U.S. audience, Dick Smith has founded this massive electronics business, a bit like Best Buy here. And so when I read that, it's like, oh, Dick Smith, I don't know another guy that, <laughs> you know, obviously supports a lot of adventures. So let, let's move ahead a bit because um, I want to get to the Antarctic journey. So there was a couple lead ups to that, the uh, Trans-Tasman deal going solo from Australia, New Zealand and back. That was obviously uh, not easy. Uh, seems like there aren't too many oceans that are calm all the time. Like, no, <laughs> maybe it wasn't Antarctica, but it wasn't like, you know, a milk pond. It was uh, no. pretty tough. <laughs> um, and then from there you do the 2015 Sydney to Hobart race, which, you know, people might not realize here, but starts in Sydney Harbour and you get a great view near the heads and, goes to Hobart and you've got to cross the Bass Strait and it's not every boat makes it. There are some boats that have been lost. So it's, it's not an easy thing. So all of that's preparing you for this uh, epic Antarctic uh, journey. So solo sailing is one thing. So you're preparing yourself with the Trans-Tasman deal and the city to Hobart. Why sail around Antarctic? I mean, why, why not? I don't know do a solo race through the Pacific or somewhere where it's warm. I mean, <laughs> why, why you know, you're not the first person to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of people would actually tell me, why don't you sail around Australia first? Like, do that trip. That's got to be easier, right? <laughs> and I always dreamed, uh, and like, I always thought sailing solo around Australia was actually 10 times harder than sailing solo around Antarctica because you're close to land the entire time. Remember, you're on your own. You've got to keep a lookout for all the ships, all the reefs, rocks, changing right. weather patterns, all the traffic that's out there. The, the worst is the little guys who go out on their fishing tinny in this fiberglass <laughs> fishing boat with no radar reflector and no AIS, and you just can't see them till you're almost on top of them. So, you know, sailing around Australia solo, you can't sleep more than 20 minutes at a time for the entire trip. So it is more dangerous and it is more difficult. Um, whereas Antarctica, it was actually a guy I was trying to convince to lend me his boat to sail to New Zealand for the Trans-Tasman Yacht Race because I didn't own a boat. Um, and he had this uh, racing 40-foot yacht that I was trying to charter off him or borrow or, you know, beg, borrow or steal. And he threw out the idea that maybe if I combined this Trans-Tasman yacht race with a bigger project and combine the two together, I might have a shot at getting sponsorship for it. And then I could look at buying his boat, which is suitable for this other trip, um, rather than chartering it. And um, so I looked into it and he said, oh, there's this record I was looking at doing before I had a family and it's this Antarctica record. You should look it up, Fedor Konyakov. And so I looked it up and there's this crazy Russian sailor in 2008 who sailed solo, nonstop and unassisted around Antarctica from Albany to Albany, which is located in the bottom tip of Western Australia. And he sailed directly south to 45 degrees south and then completed the whole circumnavigation between the latitudes of 45 south and 60 south in the Southern Ocean. And this guy who was trying to convince me to buy his boat was telling me to go and challenge this record. And at this stage, I'd sailed around the world with the Clipper Around the World Yacht Race. So I'd sailed 40,000 nautical miles, and a fair stint of that is in the Southern Ocean. And we did have some fairly decent storms coming through in the Southern Ocean. So I had a really healthy respect for how dangerous that ocean can be. And this guy was saying, oh, yeah, no, you haven't sailed solo yet. But look at sailing solo around Antarctica. This would be a great trip. And so my instant reaction was, 
absolutely no way. Uh, it's madness and it would be suicide. And, and why would I want to challenge a trip like that? It's just not possible. And I kind of put it out of my mind and I went back to work and I was skippering yachts at the time. So I was just out at sea sailing boats and I couldn't kind of shake this idea that there's this Antarctica trip. And I was like, oh, I really wanted a project that's unique enough for me to get sponsorship that's challenging enough that I want to do it and interesting enough. Um, and it kind of ticked all those boxes, but there was this huge unknown factor with how dangerous it could be down there. And it was months of kind of thinking and dreaming and visualizing and wondering and doing a lot of research on the historical weather data. And I slowly, you know, as the time went by, I started to, to think more and more, maybe it's possible. Like, you know, maybe it's something someone could do, you know, and then I had to think, well, maybe it's something I could do. Mm. And, and then working towards, you know, this idea of, yeah, okay, I'm going to do it. And it was about four months that that time period uh, of thinking and dreaming. And I remember calling mum up and I hadn't done the Trans-Tasman yacht race yet. So I hadn't actually sailed solo okay. before at this point. <laughs> and I called mum and I said, so mum, you know, I've got this Trans-Tasman. What about combining it with this other trip? What if I sail solo around Antarctica? And she instantly was like, nah, no, not a chance. You're not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, so I kind of put it to bed and, and sort of left it on a shelf and went and did the solo trans-Tasman yacht race and I finished that race and I said to mum I was like so what about this Antarctica idea and she's like oh I suppose you've proven that you can sail solo now and you know you did really well with that last race okay but you got to make sure it's safe and so that <laughs> sort of started the process and um and yeah, it was three and a half years till I actually was able to make it happen. It's funny how, you know, moms and dads always want their kids to be safe. It's a sort of a funny, funny thing that, but it's a must be uh, hardwired. So uh, not quite in the same thing that you're talking about, but uh, I have two sons and a daughter, a daughter in the middle of the all in their twenties. And my daughter is the particularly adventurous one. The boys get seasick like me. Uh, <laughs> my daughter doesn't get seasick at all. So she inherited her mother's genes, but I like her already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, same height as you, funnily enough. I know you write about that in the book, but um, uh, anyway, uh, she's very mission orientated. And so she said to, you know, me, uh, mom, dad, I'm thinking I'd like to um, go to the Congo with this relief agency. You know, it's a really dangerous place. So initially, it's kidding, forget about it. But when you're over 21, you can say forget about it, but it doesn't have too much weight. <laughs> and then after that, it was, well, I think I'd like to go to South Sudan with the same place. I mean, both are really, really dangerous places. Yeah. It was with a very well-run outfit that took care of her. But uh, yeah, so a uh, different orbit, but... It's, fu it's one thing for mum and dad to say, no, nope, you're not doing it. But at a certain point, it's your life. And you say, well, I appreciate your perspective, but <laughs> <no>. <laughs> we're doing it. But anyway, your mum came around. But so, um, so as we lead up to this epic uh, voyage, so you got this boat, I guess, from a fellow, the, the Funnel Web, which you then renamed Climate Action Now. And yes. um, we did the whole thing. It had all these watertight compartments. And I love the whole uh, thing you did with... Um, Obviously, you have a perspective. See if I, know I wrote it down somewhere here about uh, uh, climate change, uh, which can be such a huge issue. Like, how can we make a difference? And I think you said something like, "All it takes is one small step or action." When you have millions of people taking these positive actions, you have real impact. So it can e it can be easy to think, "How can we make a difference?" All this pollution in the ocean and climate change, but and then you put post-it notes. On, on your boat, Climate Action, to talk about that, because that's a very fun thing. So, yeah, talk about that whole vision, getting the boat and the post-it notes and leading up to setting off. Yeah, awesome. So, um, for me, I've always been very climate-minded, obviously, with my childhood and being exposed to nature at a young age and growing up in the bush. And um, I have a healthy respect for our environment. And the one thing I've sort of witnessed or, or, or felt was that, when you mention the words climate change or climate action, anything to do with, you know, that message, so to speak, it becomes political and people also feel it's too big of a problem that their little piece doesn't make a difference. And so they, they don't do anything because they feel like they're insignificant to creating a difference or making a difference. So 
for me, the goal was to inspire a positive message, to empower people, to um, forget about the negatives associated with the words and how can we positively influence people to create a nice change in their life. And so what I did was I went out to community members all around Australia, every talk or event that I did, every time I had the boat on display before the record, and I collected post-it note messages. And each post-it note was a message from someone in the public who was doing something for our environment. And I would just say, just pop something on the message, anything you're doing at all. Maybe you don't use water bottles and you have a reusable water bottle. Maybe you pick rubbish up when you're walking down the street. Maybe your kids have a plastic free lunchbox, whatever these little actions were. And then we collected them all up and then turned them into this big vinyl wrap that we actually wrapped the whole hull of my boat in. Um, and it really changed my goals with the record because it was less now about just a single girl sailing solo around Antarctica and it was more about me carrying these thousands and thousands of messages and the amount of people that come up to me and say that they've submitted another message through the website or um, you know they've been down into the marina and they've read all the messages on the hull of their boat or they've had their six-year-old kid reading the messages and they've decided to go plastic free at school or you know and so there is this really positive effect that comes from it and one thing I've also learned is that if you start with one thing, maybe you say no to straws or maybe you say no to single-use plastic bags, um, then suddenly you start becoming a little more aware of your actions. And we do have to take some responsibility for us as consumers with how much we're consuming and how we're consuming things. And so people start to think differently. Maybe at the supermarket, I won't grab that packet of veggies wrapped in plastic. I'll grab the packet of veggies loose and I'll put them in my own bag. Small things like that can all make a really massive difference. And when one person's influenced, then they start talking about it. They start explaining to their friends or they're out shopping and their kids ask why they're doing it that way or, you know, and it creates this roll-on effect. I kind of feel like it's a bit contagious. And so that positive, that positivity and those positive actions can actually expand from that one person, that one opportunity. And um, my goal is to show people that as an individual, you have the power to create change. It just starts with one thing. And that's such an important message because you can easy it can be easy to think, you know, all the pollution in the ocean that you write about is just one one part of it is just heartbreaking and what that does to animals and dolphins. It's uh, but yeah, why it all it takes is one person doing one thing and it does it's huge. So let's talk about Antarctica. So you you have to get you have to buy the boat, refit it. You got all these partners who are helping you out. Obviously, still raising the money was. It's like when early endeavors wasn't easy and down to the wire. It always seems to be that way. It's never yes. easy, right? <laughs> yeah, six months to go, got 110% of funding. It's That doesn't seem your never. life or anybody's life. Uh, but so you've got to get the boat to Albany, West Australia. And for US listeners, uh, Australia is about the same size as the continental US. So going from Sydney to Albany is like a long, long way. <laughs> You know, and not an easy voice. So you finally get to Albany and, you know, you get yourself together. In January 2017, you launch out on this epic voyage. So talk a bit about that because you talk about the racetrack and having to be below 45-degree parallel. And if you go above it, you know, you'd have lost before you began or it's over. And so talk about that whole that whole um, challenge and what it was like day to day. I'm not a sailing person, but reading about, you know, you know, changing sails and jibs and then tacking and the preventer line continually busting. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, my gosh, you, you talk, you had to be not just an Adam, but a mechanic professional. I mean, every day was just so hard as, you know, what, what do they say? I think the U S seals, when they're asked, they have some mantra, like the only easy day is yesterday. It's, you know, sounds a bit like your, your life. The only easy day was yesterday, which wasn't that easy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so just yeah. talk about that whole racetrack, 45 degrees and the day-to-day -day life on this epic voyage. 
Perfect. So uh, basically, because I was challenging Fedor Konyakov's record, and I he was the second person to have sailed solo around Antarctica. So I was trying or aiming to be the third person to do the trip, solo, nonstop and unassisted. Uh, and because I was challenging his record, the World Sailing Speed Record Council, which is the governing body of sailing records, they uh, basically said to me, in order to be eligible, I would have to start and finish from the same place he did, which was Albany in Western Australia. And I would need to keep between the same latitude and longitudes or sorry, parallels that he was sailing on. So when Fedor Konyakov did it, he did it as part of this race called the Antarctica Cup Ocean Race. So he was effectively on this racetrack, which was that parallel between 45 and 60 South. And if he went outside of those lines at any point, he voided his record. So because I was challenging his record, I had the same rules, even though I wasn't actually racing on the racetrack or had the committee behind me, the race committee behind me. So I set off from Albany. I had to go directly South for about 700 miles until I entered into the uh, a formal racetrack and then I could turn left under 45 degrees south and start heading over towards Tasmania and I effectively went clockwise around the bottom of the planet and I remember the day I left it was this I was just so tired because as you said you never get the sponsorship or the money until like right at the end when people know you're you're going and you're making it happen and then you've got like a year's worth of work you've got to cram into a few months and so it's just this intensity that you have that I don't think I've ever done a trip that doesn't have me up all night the night before I leave and I think I managed about two hours sleep the night before I left and in fact that first week at sea I feel like I got more sleep than I did in the weeks leading up to the departure of the voyage which is Mm. um, you know really hard unusual considering I'm sleeping in catnaps and uh, so I left and I remember casting off the lines and there was this moment of complete panic because I hadn't I've been visualizing leaving and I've been visualizing all the things that could possibly go wrong out there. And um, the Southern Ocean is well known as the world's most dangerous ocean. And it's because effectively there's no landmass down there to break up the storms. So as a storm rolls around the bottom of the ocean, it goes the entire way around the planet and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and, and more aggressive as it goes. And it creates this unique swell where you can have waves the size of houses or more um, just on a daily basis. That's your average swell. So it's this incredibly dangerous place to be in. And as part of my preparation process, i had been visualizing all these scenarios that could incur from knockdowns to rollovers to breaking masts to hitting an iceberg to hitting a sunken container to flooding the boat to losing the keel to getting myself injured. And so I was thinking about all these possible scenarios. And when I finally left, it just kind of crashed into me that, you know, hang on. I'm now having to do this. It's, it's no longer this thing I'm visualizing. It's not this thing I'm imagining. It's, it's something I'm actively going out and doing right now. And I then had to remind myself that I'd done the preparation because I was terrified. I started shaking. I started hyperventilating. I was like choking on my, my air and I just was freaking out completely. And I had to take a couple of calming breaths and remind myself that I prepared for this, that I'd worked really hard for this and that I could do it. And when I left, I, I then just settled in, but there was this sort of ominous feeling as I sailed south to that line because the further south I went, the, the sort of greyer the skies would get and the bigger the swell was and the colder it was and, and just the, how much more isolated and alone you feel. And there's this idea of how bad it, is bad going to be. Because you never quite know. You can always think about it, but you're never 100%. Like, you just don't know how bad is bad. And, um, but, yeah, I mean, I I went off. I used the first couple of weeks of the voyage as just settling into life at sea. I I was going to be on board for an estimated three months. So I was planning to be isolated for that length of time. So I really wanted to pace myself and I wanted to pace the boat as well. So I took the uh, approach of having a really fast boat and sailing it slowly. And by having a light, fast boat, it meant I didn't have to change my sails for every weather pattern or every weather change that came through. And if I was a little under canvassed with the sails, that's okay because I was still making pretty decent speeds 
even with the less sailor. Um, so that really allowed me to take the pressure off me by having that approach. And uh, my greatest goal of the whole trip, whilst I was challenging Fedor's record and whilst I was trying to become the first woman to do it, my biggest goal was just do the loop and come home alive because then I would have succeeded. Everything else was just extras. Um, and I asked, actually just coming back to that point of talking about success or failure in those moments in time, the other thing I really did was because the challenge of getting to the start line was so big, I actually said to myself, well, as long as I can leave, as long as I get on the boat and I leave, regardless of what happens next, I've succeeded because I've got the goal, I got the boat, I got the trip off the ground and I left. And everything else was this kind of thing that I couldn't really control because weather and factors are around that. But as long as I left, I knew I'd already succeeded. So mm. that really took that pressure off. And that's really an important point is reframing the big goal of going around Antarctica into mini goals. Okay, first goal yes. is to leave. Second goal is to get on the racetrack, or maybe there was a yeah. goal before that, but just mini goals, you know, waypoints as I guess they call them in, in, in boating. But, um, you know, reading that book and anybody that's read it, or I think there's a, a documentary uh, to, it's just... Um, it's just hard to fathom how you could carry on each day because each day was unbelievably hard. So talk about an average day. You know, you're sailing below the 45th parallel. What, what was an average day? What's, what kind, you know, help the listeners understand what you did on an average day when there's storms and gales going all over the place. Yeah, so an average day is really, um, you know, like I said, it strips you back to that eat, sleep, sail mentality because you don't have room for anything else your whole world is how do I survive in this storm and so every decision you make is around that so generally I my my body clock got completely out of whack and the weather patterns affected when I could sleep or when I couldn't sleep and more often than not there was a weather shift in the morning um, sort of around 6 a.m so I'd be up on deck trimming sails changing the angle of the sails um, then I'd get below freezing cold it's all about two degrees three degrees so it's icy mm. icy cold and I'd try and warm so myself that, that's up that's two or three degrees celsius Celsius, yes. I'm quite sure it's still probably. It's still what, cold. For yeah, it's probably like 30 <laughs> Fahrenheit. I don't know what it is. What it is is terrible. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> and then I would um, send a text message to my shore team to tell them what happened over the night and let them know that I'm safe and I'm alive still and that it's all going okay. I would either eat something if I was hungry, which I normally wasn't at that point, or I would get a couple more hours sleep and I would then bounce out of bed again or crawl out of bed, should I say, at about 12 o'clock after having um, four or five little nana naps, I call them. So um, <laughs> they're generally 20 minutes. Um, the further I got from risk, so I could increase those sleeps up to 40 minutes. And I think the longest single sleep I got in the whole record was about an hour and a half. So mm. um, it's lots of little baby sleep. So you're never really sleeping. So you're always kind of operating on this intense level of fatigue and um, sleep deprivation. And I would have to alter my priorities when my sleep deprivation would get so bad that I couldn't function very well or my emotions were out of whack and, and, ch and change it so that I wasn't optimizing the sales anymore. I was just trying to get some sleep, but I still couldn't sleep more than, you know, that 20 to 40 minute block at a time uh, before the boat would need some attention. Uh, I would then get up, I would have to do some daily maintenance. So I'd walk around and I would, um, you know, check the bilges for water. I would go on deck and do a deck walk and I would just check that things are looking okay. I would get a weather forecast, communicate with my shore team, um, send a blog home, those sorts of things. And by about sort of eight or nine at night, I'd be trying to have some dinner, um, which was always a really basic um we call it freeze-dried food. It's kind of like what the astronauts eat, which is like a, a pouch of dried goods mm -hmm. and you add a cup of boiling water to it and it's all kind of the same texture, all kind of tastes the same, um, but you get on with it. And then um, so have my dinner and then I would always be aiming to get to bed before midnight, almost never happened. And so I'd be getting ready for bed at like 10, 11 o'clock at night and when I say bed, I mean, I would be in bed for four or five hours, but I'm still doing all those little naps in that period of time. And then inevitably around midnight, 
there would be a sail change required and I would either have to put a reef in because the winds have increased, shake a reef out because the winds have decreased or they've changed direction on me and I'd have to be on deck doing something with the sails. Um, so that would then cause me to get completely soaked head to toe by icy cold water, which wakes you up, which makes it impossible to try and get 20 minute naps. And, uh, and then I would have to come back, back down below after an hour or two of fighting with the sails on deck and getting smashed by waves and, and just generally um, having a really fun time of it. Uh, and then I would uh, try and get a couple more nana naps. So it was just this constant, you, your priorities are secondary to the boat's priorities in that environment. And the boat's requirements generally outpace what your requirements are. So you fork up, you, you forego things like sleep or food on occasion because the boat needs attention or the boat needs work. And I generally operated, I, I would try and do something that I call sleep banking. And that is where I never know when the next emergency is going to occur. I never know when I might have to be up for two days at a time or, you know, when the next storm's around the corner, something could go wrong and it causes me to be awake for a long period of time. And because you're already operating at these extreme fatigue measures, I would bank my sleep. So that meant any time I wasn't trimming sails or eating, I was trying to rest in my bunk. And even if I couldn't sleep, I would at least be laying down in bed, whether I was reading a book in bed or not, just so that my body is getting some rest because the rest of the time it feels like you've run a marathon and you've got another five marathons to go and you just got to suck it up and find the energy from somewhere. And what's amazing is every day was like what you just described as I yes. read the book, you know, sail changes, 20 minute nano naps, and then you've got this... <laughs> alarm thing saying change sale you're off course do something it keeps blaring away i mean then you the team approaching yep it's not looking good you know because it seems like it's it's the southern ocean so obviously a key moment is you're somewhere i don't know probably seven eight hundred miles south of cape down somewhere and you're in another big storm and somehow the mass breaks you talk about electrolysis and lines and you figured some of that out later, but that was when, you know, your whole journey changed. So talk about what happened when the mast broke and uh, that was a huge crucible, if you will, in this, in this journey. And can we stop one second for listeners who may not have a great grasp of, of sailing when a mast breaks, let's explain what that means. I, to me, that means you don't have a sail anymore. Is that right? Yeah, so you don't have any means of propulsion anymore. So the mast is the pointy up bit that all your sails fly off. So when it snaps, all your sails are, are gone as well. And what also occurs is that your mast can become a weapon. And it's this thing that's still attached to the boat through ropes and riggings, but it's now getting pushed and shoved by all the swell and the waves that are out there. And more often than not, it can get driven by a wave through the hull of your boat, effectively sinking you. Mm. Um, so a mast breaking is an incredibly dangerous thing to have occur. It's, it's snapping, ripping ropes. It's, you know, just tons of force of pressure getting applied to everything and, in fact, since I've been back from this trip, I've had numerous people come up to me and say, you know, I survived a demasting with a crew of 15 and I was terrified. I don't know how you did it, you know, on your own in the middle of those oceans. So um, it's, it's certainly one of the biggest risks that, one of the bigger risks, should I say, that sailors face out to sea. Um, yeah, it's definitely <laughs> not a good thing so, to have happen. So as Warwick said, enormous crucible. What was it like for you when that happened to you? 